Hi everyone, this is Nick Wilshire and I'm hosting the pre-recorded talk for the Tuesday 10th of August 2021 OXOC uh, session. Um, we are all in the field this, this coming week, so we are pre-preparing this, um, this talk for all of you. So some of you actually may watch this talk before the, the usual uh, Tuesday evening session at 6.30, um, but the, the link will be made available after the recording of the session. And, um, you know, so if you do watch it at the, at the normal slot, that's great. And um, if some of you catch the link before, um, please go ahead and, and watch it and start commenting on the uh, talk. It'll be a little bit different, uh, the format this, this time in terms of the questions and answers. So instead of using the live chat box on the right hand side, um of the, of the talk please use the comments um button at the, at the video and ask whatever questions you, you'd like uh, or comments and uh Kay will be getting back to you on that page so you'll be able to um, get notifications of the answers that she'll give you about your particular queries so today's speaker uh, is claire browning She's a paleontologist, and so we're very lucky to have her. She's uh, recorded her talk for this uh, session, and uh, it's about to, to play as soon as I've introduced her. Um, some of you may have met her. She's the current curator of the Karoo Paleontology section of the Zico South African Museum. And her talk is about the period of about 260 million years ago in the Karoo. Uh, she's, uh, she was born in Bege and studied at Nelson Mandela, uh, Nelson Mandela University, uh, where she completed her undergraduate. Uh, Claire spent a year studying photography after she returned to NMU to complete an MSc in geology on the Bockefeld group fossils uh, in Stateleville. She took up a contract lecturer position at NMU before accepting a full-time position as a geologist at the Council for Geoscience in Cape Town where she worked for nine years on a mixture of commercial mapping and research projects throughout South Africa and Madagascar. Um, so she's a very nice uh, person and, and is very keen and a very, um, very good uh, researcher. So, so she has a lot of interesting things in her talk that uh, I'll get to play just in a second. So let's put this out and hopefully it all plays correctly from the first time. So here we go. Hi everyone and welcome to today's talk. My name is Claire and today I'd like to share with you some stories from the ancient fossils of the Karoo. Driving through the Karoo from the mother city to Joburg invokes different emotions in different people. For many it's a long, boring, flat road where you have to keep kids busy by playing games like I Spy. And after the fifth S for sheep, everybody gets a little tired of that game too. To others, the sense of peace and stillness invoked by the open landscape offers a welcome escape from the chaos of modern city living. Today I'd like to invite you to add one more dimension to your experience of the South African Karoo, an appreciation of deep time. I will take you through a journey into deep time by telling you three stories. Let's start with a story about a paleontological paradise. So the dry landscape that we know today was not always like this. When the massive supercontinent Gondwana was still around, present day South Africa looked very, very different for a long time. Here's a um, reconstruction of what Gondwana looked like about 260 million years ago. And you see, it kind of looks like a massive jumble of continents. And that's really what it is. Modern day Africa, India, uh, South America, many other continents were all joined in the supercontinent known as Gondwana. And for about 120 million years, this, this supercontinent was really quite stable. In fact, the Karoo area records changes in landscape from glaciers through meandering rivers to dune fields and lava flows. And over this time, the animals and plants living here changed in remarkable ways. And the stories of these changes are written in the rocks and fossils waiting to be discovered. In this beautiful painting by Megan Newman, we see the Karoo landscape about 285 million years ago. 
most of the snow and ice that covered South Africa during the Karoo Ice Age has now melted away and large areas of the land are covered with forest that will be buried deep into the earth and eventually form coal. Fast forward to 265 million years and the inland sea has completely dried up. The Karoo landscape is now dominated by meandering rivers where a diversity of plants and animals live and die. These may look like dinosaurs, but they're not actually. They're quite a lot older than the dinosaurs, and they're actually the very distant ancestors of mammals and tortoises. Then, around 252 million years ago, disaster hit. The biggest mass extinction event ever seen on this planet. The devastation to life on Earth is recorded in minute details in the rocks and fossils of the Karoo. Changes in rainfall pattern, soil erosion, and all other kinds of physical features resulted in the die-off of huge amounts of vegetation and animals, and this die-off is recorded in these rocks. In fact, the Karoo Basin is the best place on Earth to, dis to study the effects of the end Permian mass extinction on land, and it's therefore of scientific importance on an international scale. And now for some dinosaurs. We all know how much people like dinosaurs. <laughs> These are very early dinosaurs, and they were on the Karoo around 190 million years ago. Um, Africa at this time had moved further north, and it was very dry here. In the background, you can see sand dunes and volcanoes. Pangaea, which is another supercontinent, was cracking up, and the hot molten lava was oozing out of cracks um, in the earth. Other than dinosaurs, there were also very early mammals on the, on the landscape and many different types of plants like ginkgos, monkey puzzle trees and cycads. To many people, fossils hold value in the fact that they are heritage objects and fossils, fossils are also fascinating to people because they tell the story of life on Earth and um, how animals changed over time. And seeing as we're a part of that system, um, it's inherently interesting to some people. But for those that are not necessarily interested in the, the origin stories, fossils are also of importance for other reasons. One of them is as a, a, a tool to be able to tell us about commodities. And a really good example of a, of a commodity that we we use every day and that we need fossils to understand is uh, coal. Um, and in South Africa, most of the coal fields um, come from fossilized karoo plants uh, that died a very long time ago and are now buried deep within the, the rocks. Um, other examples of commodities in the Karoo or exploration in the Karoo for commodities is that of uranium and gas. And these are quite controversial topics, which I'm not going to get into today. A less controversial use of fossils is paleotourism. Here are some photos of the paleotourism center known as the Kitching Center in New Bethesda, just outside Hrafronet. And for those of you that don't know, Hrafronet is in the, the Eastern Cape. So um, at this center, you can go with a local guide to have a look for fossils in a riverbed. And you can also go to the center where you can learn about um, how people take fossils out of the rocks in a process called fossil preparation. And there's similar initiatives around the country, like at the Fossil Trail in the Karoo National Park. So if you wanted any other reason to care about a pile of dead bones, the verdict is out and we as humans are currently the leading cause of the sixth global mass extinction event on planet Earth. But we're also pretty smart primates, and there's some hope that we'll be able to figure out how to mitigate some of the devastation that we've caused. One of the tools in our climate change fighting toolkits is to learn about past extinctions and how life has recovered from them. And to do this, we need to study the rocks and the fossils, and this is why it's so important to do so. Like any modern science, studying the fossils and rocks of the Karoo is a team effort. Current researchers need to build on the impressive foundation that has been laid down by the previous generation. And so before I go down, go onto the current research and outreach programs I'm involved in, I'd like to acknowledge with gratitude the contribution of my co-workers and those who came before me. 
as well as the funding institutions that make the research possible. So what is it like to do fieldwork in the Karoo? So I often wonder what people passing by would think when they see us doing fieldwork. They might see a bunch of people sitting antisocially, scratching through dirt, or they would see people wandering through the felt a couple of meters apart from each other with their eyes firmly placed on the ground in front of them. Perhaps people are thinking that we're in a search party for missing car keys. The reason we are also focused on the ground is because it takes a lot of concentration and training to see the tiny fragments of bone and the shapes in the rocks that mean that there's a fossil inside them. When we do find something interesting, aka a fossil, <laughs> and not a plant or a flower, which we tend to get distracted by sometimes, <laughs> we log it onto our log box and uh, we carefully locate that fossil using a GPS. We write down the details of the rock surrounding it as well. And if the fossil is really large, we spend a couple of days digging it out of the rock and encasing it in plaster of Paris before we carry it back to our vehicle. And uh, carrying it back to the vehicle is often quite a nerve-wracking process. The, the plaster jacket's really heavy and it often takes a lot of people to carry. Um, and usually the best fossils are found on the steepest slopes right at the top. So during a two-week field trip, we'll usually collect about 50 smallish fossils and we'll log in our notebooks the really large fossils that we'll need to come back for. Um, back at camp in the evenings, we lay out the fossils on a table and we excitedly show our colleagues our finds for the day. Often the best find wins a beer and that person can enjoy the best seat at the fire. One of the best parts about doing field work is that we're able to visit very interesting places that many people might not get to explore. And sometimes we're even lucky enough to find a camping spot with a view. So fossils, when we find them in the field, are not always the same quality. When a fossil has been lying on the surface of the ground for a long time, it becomes very brittle and fragile, and it starts to break apart. And it's really, really difficult to salvage this kind of fossil. And so we don't generally take it back with us into the lab. Um, and an example of that is this, this rib bone that you can see on the photo um, on your left um, with a little bit of vertebra. So, and in the middle picture, there's a stack of vertebra and I'm looking pretty excited to have found it. But to be honest, it wasn't particularly diagnostic because it's only a tiny piece of, um, of an entire animal that in the case of vertebrates is not particularly uh, useful to tell us what kind of animal it is. And on the photograph on the, on the right, you see a tiny little eye poking out, sticking out of the rock. You see that circle in the middle of the photo? That's a little eye. And the rest of the fossil is still embedded, hidden inside the rock. And this kind of fossil is exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for something that is still protected by the rock um, as it is. So basically what we're looking for are fossils that we're able to that could be transported back um, into the, the lab from the field and won't get damaged during transportation. And when we get the fossil into the lab, we very, very carefully, tiny bit by tiny bit, remove the, the rock from the bone in a process known as fossil preparation. But as you can imagine, if you're taking a lump of rock that you expect to find a fossil in um, back into the lab to prepare it, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes you're not quite sure what you're going to get. Sometimes you find a fossil that looks really, really promising in the field, and when you bring it back, it's nothing but a scramble of bones. So I wish that this was not a virtual lecture, because I would have loved to have seen your reaction to this photo if I'd asked you if you found it particularly inspiring. I would hazard a guess that many of you would have stifled a yawn um, and kind of nodded at me a little bit uh, tired at this point in the lecture. Um, and I can't blame you for it. It doesn't look particularly inspiring. <laughs> but I can tell you that it was the location of a really exciting find um, from the last field trip. When I found this little fossil skull, I was kind of over it. It was after lunch and the wind was blowing like crazy and I didn't have much hopes for this dry riverbed. 
Um, but there it's a lesson in l learning to just keep your eyes on the rocks and see what you can find. Here in the Azico Karoo Paleontology Lab, we have the a amazing team of really, really skilled fossil preparators. And the kind of work that they do is honestly world-class. So a fossil that looked like this in the field to begin with turns out into this amazingly detailed little animal um, over here on the on the on your right hand side. Um, it turns out that the fossil that I found in the in the river valley is a little um theragnesis. Uh, fossil. And Theragnathus is a type of a mammal-like reptile um, or a very early mammal ancestor. So once our beautiful specimen has been fully prepared, um, it's time to do research. And there are traditional methods of paleontological research uh, where we measure the bones and we describe and draw the bones in, in a lot of detail. Um, but there's also a suite of new techniques that have been developed in recent years. One of you, these is uh, CT scanning, and in the photograph on the, the top left, you'll see my um, colleague Moefe at the uh, center, um, uh, sorry, the, the central analytical facility in Stellenbosch, and she's busy scanning um, a little skull of an animal known as a kistocephalus or cystocephalus. And um, here's a photograph of the little skull on the right-hand side. And you can see how beautifully the scan has come out. Um, the front of the, the, the um, head of the animal is the top here, and then the bottom is, is where its neck's coming out. And we can tell amazing things um, about these animals um, looking at the scans, including what their brain case might have looked at like. And we, at the moment, we're doing some research, um, having a look at the inner ear of this animal to see, uh, well, to, to find out um, how how it um, heard sounds and to see whether perhaps um, it might have been an animal that spent a lot of time underground. So once the research has been done on a particular um, fossil specimen, it gets put into the collections. And uh, collections are incredibly important, um, not only because they provide a, a safe storage space for these fossils and a, a way to archive um, them for, for future generations, um, but also because there's many new discoveries that can actually be made on fossils that we thought had been completely studied. And one really good example of um, a hidden treasure found in the Karoo paleontology collections is this little uh, snout of, uh, well, it's not really little, <laughs> the snout of a Gorgonopsian. Um, there's an image at the bottom left that shows a reconstruction of a Gorgonopsian that you can see in the stone bones exhibit um, at Ezeko. Um, and the snout that we that my colleagues and I um, found in the Karoo paleontology collection was only a partial snout of one of these Gorgonopsians. So you'll see um, the long um, tooth a saber tooth uh, at the, the front of the, the, the face of the animal. Um, and at the top, um, you'll see, well, you might see a tiny little black dot. And to the trained eye under a microscope, this is pretty significant. And I'll explain to you now why. So my colleague, um, Dr. Julian Benoit, who is based at the Evolutionary Science Institute at um, Wurz, actually found um, this or re recognized this this callus on the snout of the Gorgonopsian. Um, and he brought it to me in my in my office um, because it was really quite peculiar. Um, it's kind of this darkened um, texture or darkened color, um, knobbly texture um, on the bone. And in the inside, we saw an embedded tooth. And what was fascinating about this tooth is that it was the size and shape and it had all the other features of a Gorgonopsian as well. So the fact that it was a healed wound, as in the callus um, formed, meant that the bite was not fatal. And the location of that particular tooth in the callus also meant that, that the behavior that was being displayed was likely not um, a predator-prey relationship, as in if another animal wanted to kill the Gorgonopsian, it would probably have gone for the neck rather than the snout. And so that got us thinking about um, other animals that display social behavior or social biting today. And there are examples of wolves and dogs 
um, where they go for the, the snout of the other animal. And it's usually a dominance display in males. So we wrote about um, this hypothesis uh, in a scientific paper. Um, and we also read a popular article um, speaking about the possibility for social habits in our non-mammalian ancestors and the significance of this um, being that this behavior might have developed way before um, other mammal um, characteristics, characteristics appeared in the fossil record. And you can have a look at the popular article um, using the link um, below. And this article will also sh um, direct you to the original scientific paper as well. But of course, um, finding fossils and learning about them needs to be shared with everyone. And so uh, w I'm involved in a number of outreach and education projects at the museum uh, with my colleagues. And um, we recently worked on a project called uh, Puppet Planet, where um, some of the Karoo creatures are represented as, um, as puppets. And there's a TV show that's being filmed um, to explain fossilizations and the importance of the fossils of the Karoo. Another way to um, try to share fossil discoveries as much as possible with as many people is through social media. And um, these are my various social media accounts. But you can also follow the, the discoveries made um, through the Zico Museum's um, social media and website. Um, if you'd like to keep track of some of the research that's happening, uh, you're welcome to have a look at my Google Scholar and um, ORCID accounts. So I hope that I've been able to share with you the passion that I have for Karoo fossils. And I hope that when you daydream about um, your next road trip into the Karoo, that they enter your mind even for a moment. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, I hope I timed that correctly. It was really, really interesting. Thank you, Claire. Um, and I'm sure there are going to be uh, some very good comments and questions for you. Uh, so for everyone, just don't forget um, to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't uh, done so already, uh, and to add your comments so that uh, Claire can uh, receive your questions uh, for this pre-recorded talk. Um, and we will catch you all in a month's time again for the, for the next speaker. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you all enjoy it. And have a great evening once you watch the watch watch the talk. Cheers, everyone.